Good you evening. Are. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Council Advisory Committee CAC meeting of 10 May 2021. This meeting is being conducted with COVID-19 protocols in place for social distancing and isolation. The meeting is being conducted electronically using Zoom and is being live streamed on Facebook Live. The most up-to-date meeting package is on the Town of Kentville website. And we've also included an acronym guide for those of you who uh, have been wondering about that special language that we speak sometimes. The public may send questions directly to our recording secretary's email at jwest at kentville.ca. This meeting is called to order. Have all of the councillors received and reviewed their meeting packages? Does any member of council have information pertaining to a matter before this council which has not been publicly circulated? As the council advisory committee, the CAC, we will vote as a committee to either send business forward to the council meeting for ratification, return to staff for further information or review, or defeat the recommendation. I will remind members of council that we should continue to be mindful of our decision-making wheel to make balanced and respectful decisions while adhering to our code of conduct. We will be voting by poll and the chair will call your name and ask how say you. This method permits, permits us to verbally record your vote. Are there any conflict of interest issues we should be aware of before we commence the meeting? None, that's great. CAO Tro, could you please take the roll call? Thank you, Mayor Snow. And based upon the faces and the names I see on the screen, all of council is present and accounted for. Perfect, thank you very much. CAO, we have been provided uh, with proposed agenda. Do you have anything to add to this agenda? No, Mayor Snow, I do not. All right, are there any further additions or deletions to this agenda? If not, if I could have a motion, please. Councillor Huntley, thank you. Councillor York, I've got you for the second. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried, thank you. Council Advisory Committee meeting uh, minutes from April 12th, 2021 have been distributed for approval. Are there any changes? Uh, if not, the minutes are approved as distributed. If there are, the recording secretary will annotate the minutes. Are there any changes to those minutes? None, all right, moving on then. So we have two presentations this evening. It gives me uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce from Accessibility uh, Nova Scotia, Jerry Post, and uh, from the Kentville Accessibility Plan, Laurel Taylor. So we will start with, uh, with Jerry Post. Uh, several of us have, uh, have heard Jerry speak before. He was, uh, he was at our NSFM uh, Spring Conference in Truro in 2019 with Rick Hansen. And uh, we've seen him a couple other times uh, out and about and uh, giving some, uh, some great and uh, inspirational uh, chats to us. Uh, so Jerry, the floor is yours, please. Did we lose him, Jason? Uh, no, he's a panelist. I'm just <laughs> waiting for him to start his video. And oh, okay. Me. Okay. Thank can you. you can, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Well, it's a it's a real pleasure to uh, to to be here. Uh, as some of you know, I I started my professional life in the, at the municipal level uh, about 50 years ago. So it's a long time ago. Um, and uh, and I really enjoy working at the local level because you know that's where the rubber hits the road when it comes to implementing things. Uh, so uh, so yeah. So today uh, I'm gonna be talking obviously about accessibility, and I'll uh, get my little slide going here. Um, can you see the slide? Not yet. Not yet. Hey Jason, uh, is he? He's, he's there. Yep, I'm here. You can share your screen. Everybody can. How do I uh, share the screen? Uh, there's a green button in the middle of Zoom that says share screen. Okay, yeah, there okay. it is. Perfect. Okay, let's see if I can get my screen. 
I think it's working. Can you see that now? We can, perfect. Perfect, okay, well, thanks. So uh, I've entitled my presentation, uh, Accessibility, Realizing American of Hope. And of course, that's based on the, uh, the tremendous journey that uh, Rick Hansen made over 30 years ago to, uh, to basically you know, advocate for greater accessibility. Uh, and uh, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Uh, and as the plan has indicated, you know, it's going to take some time. And the province, as you know, has set a sort of a target of uh, 2030 that we're trying to work towards. And uh, the, the, I think the big thing that, uh, that has really been driving uh, all the activity within the province are these numbers. Uh, you know, in Nova Scotia, as you probably know, about 30% of our population has a disability. And if you're a senior like I am, uh, it's, it's 41%. So that, that's quite a, quite a number. Um, and it's much higher than the Canadian average because we also are the oldest province in, the, in our federation and confederation. Uh, so, and, and the reason for that being, obviously, is that people are living longer uh, and, uh, you know, when you live longer, you break down. And that's essentially what, uh, what happened to me. Uh, about eight years ago, I was working overseas, uh, advising uh, a government uh, on some, well, actually planning issues. Uh, I didn't feel so well, so I flew back to Canada. Uh, I went to see my doctor. He didn't know what was going on and sent me to an emergency. And uh, within an hour, they figured out what was going on with me, uh, the doctor came in along with someone else who I didn't recognize and uh, it was the chaplain. Uh, they noticed that I was a Roman Catholic and uh, they, they asked me, uh, you know, they told me that my situation was very serious. Uh, they needed to operate immediately and uh, the survival rate of what they had to do to me was about a 50-50. So they asked if I, uh, if I wanted uh, my last rites. Uh, which I accepted, and uh, you know, I obviously survived the uh, the operation, but uh, it put me in a wheelchair. So, uh, and you know, that was quite an experience for me because I'd always been very, very active. Um, now, what's important is, of course, is what's happening within our province. And when you look at the population projections produced by Stats Canada and accepted by our province. All the growth in population that is predicted is in the cohort of 65 and over. So we're going to be seeing an increase in number of persons with disabilities, but all the design thinking is still for that cohort that is much younger. Um, so we really need to start shifting things so people can live in place and, uh, and live a, a longer and, uh, and more rewarding, rewarding life. Uh, while I was in hospital, actually, uh, this was happening. I was in hospital for about, uh, for about a year, and, uh, and the province uh, had announced that they would be doing an Accessibility Act. Uh, one of the first things that they did was they appointed uh, the Honorable Kevin Murphy as speaker, uh, which was very, very significant because, you know, whenever the legislature set, sat, you know, when you looked at the speaker, you saw a man in a wheelchair who is very, very capable. Uh, the other interesting thing was when I was in hospital, uh, you know, the primary concern was to make sure that I, I lived through this tremendous operation that I had. And uh, I was in rehab for about six months and all the focus in rehab is on sort of your physical well-being, but not so much about from the neck up. <laughs> And then, and that's really where you need a lot of help as well, because it's of course an enormous shock when you're a healthy individual, very active, and then bang, you know, you lose your mobility. And uh, and what was interesting, that thing from the head up, uh, it was the other patients that helped me with that. Uh, to give you an example, uh, when I arrived at the rehab center, they said, "Well, you'll be here for about six months." They gave and. Luckily with my insurance, I, I was able to get a private room, but 
but there was no internet. <laughs> and you know, I'm gonna be in bed for six months without internet, you know, I, I'm a gadget guy. So they said, well, Jerry, if you want internet, you know, you're gonna move across the hall, but you'll be with three other patients. And I said, well, move me over. And I went there and it was the best decision that I'd ever made. Uh, I was there with three roommates. Uh, the roommate uh, across from me was an elderly man. Uh, sorry, it was an elderly man in his, in his, uh, in his mid seventies who'd fallen off a chair and uh, had broken his neck. So he was paralyzed from the neck down. Everything worked from the neck up, but couldn't do nothing. And we got chatting and he saw me playing with my, uh, with my iPad. And the two things that he loved to do was one is listen to the radio. And the other is to talk to his granddaughter who lived in Calgary. Of course, everything had to be done for him. You know, they had to turn on his radio, change the channel and all that. So here I am playing with my iPad and he says, what's that? And I said, well, let me show you, you know? So I had them transfer me in, in a wheelchair and I went over to his bed and we got playing around and I says, listen, I think you can do all of this yourself. You know, listen to the radio, change channels and all that. And within 15 minutes, I had him calling his granddaughter using Siri, using my iPhone. And the impact that had on him and on me was very, very profound. We both started to cry, you know, that this very simple technology would give him that independence. Uh, and I started asking around the rehab center, well, do you have a program to, you know, to teach people to do that? And occupational therapy is still is stuck in a bit of a time warp. And that, uh, you know, they still, they do very well on all the physical things, but not much on assistive technology at the time. Well, since I was in bed, I, I started writing a proposal and which was accepted. And now they have a whole assistive technologies department in the rehab center uh, because of, you know, that connection that I made with this individual and then with some of the staff. And, and that really gave me sort of a mission. Uh, and that mission really became very profound when they passed, when they proposed the Accessibility Act. Mobilized a group of citizens uh, to get it going. And I think the major accomplishment with that act was this is that the original draft of the act was still what we call a social services act. You know, we're doing this to be nice to these poor people in wheelchairs and what have you. And we reminded the problems, there's no need to be nice to us. Just read your human rights legislation all the way from the international level down to the provincial level. It's embedded and enshrined in there, the rights of persons with disabilities. And that now is part of the act. It's all based on human rights. And that is why the Accessibility Directorate is nested in the Department of Justice and that the province has recognized that. And of course, as your report indicates as well, that accessibility is more than just wheelchairs. You know, it's, it's all disabilities. You know, people with cognitive issues, of course, hearing and sight and, uh, and what have you. So, uh, so that was also a major accomplishment with this, this act. The other thing is when we got moving on the act, uh, they tapped me on the shoulder to see if I was interested in coming out of retirement to do this. And I said, well, I'll, I'll give you two years of my life, uh, and which ended up being two and a half, but it felt like 10 <laughs> with all the things that we had to do, you know, build the team, get things moving and, uh, and what have you. And, and the approach that we use is what we call rapid results uh, with simultaneous activity streams going at the same time. And this is something that, uh, that I'd learned working internationally for a very large consultancy. It's very challenging, but at the same time, it's, it, it, it really shows to community that, uh, that things can move forward. So we had planning going on, we had development going on and we had action and results going on, but it was all done within a bubble of first voice and community. So first voice meaning persons with all types of disabilities, and what have you, as well as people in the private sector who will be impacted and, and what have you. And, and that's really important. And, and we embedded that approach actually into the, into the act by requiring public sector bodies as you are to appoint a committee 
within the community and at least half of those have to be persons with disabilities or a representative of that. And that has driven your process as well. And I'm, and I'm so pleased with the, with the outcome. On the planning side, we have a document called Access by Design 2030. And the title is extremely important. If you design it in at the front end, the cost is virtually nil. You know, we have this Rick Henson certification program. Uh, I worked with Rick uh, on that. And one of the things that, uh, that I requested is to do an independent sort of audit and analysis of what the additional cost would be for the gold standard. And the outcome of that is that the cost may be 1% of the capital cost of the building, right? But just peanuts. You know, buildings are advertised over 30, 40, 50 years, you know, 1%. And of course, that's the important thing is to ensure that things are designed in at the front end. Of course, we're dealing with also a lot of historic building and, and what have you that needs to change. And that's a more difficult challenge, uh, but there are some solutions as well. On the development side, uh, as is in your report, awareness is number one. Uh, it's what we're hearing from the community that, uh, that and, uh, and the, you'll see a lot of things that will be coming out soon with the province regarding that, a whole campaign uh, to, because once people see it, you know, they will, there's really no need for regulation. That regulation that we're developing in the standards, which is also underway, is required for that 5% who's unwilling to accommodate persons with disabilities. So a lot of standards development, the priorities are built environment and education. Uh, education's critical uh, to provide access to persons uh, with disabilities. Uh, and, and, and it's more than just getting someone to attain a degree. It's also helping them in the employment field and that'll be our next standard as well. And. Uh, and again, I had this experience at the rehab center where I met a, an outpatient, uh, a young woman who was completing her studies uh, at Dalhousie. Uh, she, uh, she then graduated with a master's degree and asked me for some help to review her resume and to see if she could find a job. She sent out 200 resumes. And in the resume, she indicated that she had a disability. Now this woman, walked away with all the prizes and all the scholarships, zero response. And then I, you know, she said, well, what do I do? I said, well, get rid of that, that sentence, <laughs> which she did, and started getting responses, you know, when she sent out more resumes. Got a few interviews, but still no job. I would have hired her like that, right? Uh, I had lost track of her. Uh, and, uh, and out of the blue, I got a call from her aunt saying that, uh, Jerry, uh, you know, I understand that, that you knew, uh, you know, and I, I want to keep it private, her, you know, this, this young woman. I said, yes, well, so unfortunately, she's no longer with us. She committed suicide. She just couldn't take it anymore. So here, here is this beautiful young woman, bright, a scholar, you know, but there's still this, this thing of, of, there's an attitudinal issue that we have to deal with. And that's why the awareness is so important. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so driven. Like that story, having met that woman and see what happened is that, uh, you know, I, I'm just driven for change. Partnerships are important. Uh, the first partnership we developed was with the Federation of Municipalities. We had a little committee going. Uh, to get direction from them. Of course, we used Wolfville, uh, you know, the mayor there at the time was the chair of that little committee to, uh, to we did a bit of a sample plan and, uh, and you've used that and in fact added value to it and improved on it from my perspective. Uh, the other things with, with the universities, uh, all the universities uh, come together on, on a regular basis. It's called the Council of Nova Scotia University Presidents with NSCC, and they have developed a, a whole accessibility framework that they're now using to prepare operational plan for each of campuses. First time in the history of North America that that has been accomplished. 
But that's the reason why it's so wonderful being in Nova Scotia. Small is beautiful, and that you can get things done fairly quickly. Plus, there's such a strong sense of community, you know, and then we see it you know, through all the activities with COVID. Rick Hansen Foundation, well, you've heard about that as well. Uh, incredible foundation and the things they're doing, and basically developed the first sort of international standard on, uh, on accessibility. Capacity building is critical. So that's why we're also doing a lot of work with the universities. It's not just about disabled students getting an education, because most of the barriers that we face as persons with disabilities have been put in place by individuals who were educated in universities. So, so we really need to embed universal design in everything that happens at the educational level and building that capacity. And that's starting to happen at Dalhousie, at Acadia, at all the universities now. So I'm really pleased with that. Action at the results. This is sort of the fun part of what I did. Of course, the whole thing of making the partnership with the Rick Hansen Foundation and NSCC to deliver their programs. We've trained about 120 people now in the province. Uh, we worked also a lot with not-for-profits uh, and social enterprises like car share. Uh, so we now have the first accessible car share uh, in Canada, in Halifax. And you'll see the van up there on the right-hand side. We also have various programs that the province announced to help business. Uh, these are grant programs. We're also doing a lot of work, and this is probably my favorite activity in the center with children. We have an activity which I called Read Ability, where we have persons with disabilities read to children about their disability. Uh, my favorite story on that is that we had a, a program in the north end of Halifax, and in this particular case, uh, we had someone from the deaf community come in with a, a ASL interpreter. So she read the story in ASL, uh, taught the kids some American Sign Language, and the impact I've had was tremendous. Uh, I got a call from one of the teachers a few days later, and she said, well, you know, Jerry, that little boy, there was one little boy I'd call him Johnny. He would not sit down, he was so excited. She says, uh, Johnny went home and he hasn't said a word for two days. He's invented his own sign language, driving his parents and his teachers crazy. So, so it's really impacted uh, these kids. And I think we need to start at that level. And that, I was so pleased to see that your committee, your consultants, uh, and the staff, you know, engage children in this initiative that you've got going in the town and the wonderful art that they've done. And uh, of course, uh, we have Will Brewer, the first town crier with Down syndrome, and that's important. In Halifax, the entire Cogswell district, redevelopment district, uh, is Rick Hansen Gold designated by Halifax. So anything going in there has to be designed to that highest level. And again, the cost is minimal when you do it at the front end, and this is the case. We also have a research program going uh, at Dalhousie and various other things. So, so I'm pretty pleased with, and that, you know, you can do things quickly uh, if you're driven and, and innovative and, and engage community because all these activities engage community through partnerships. We have an accessibility advisory board. I, I call them the, uh, the well, <laughs> this board is, is the old board. Uh, the, the, there's a new board that has come in, but I call them the apostles of accessibility. Uh, there's 12 of them and, uh, and most of them have a disability. And there was also representation from the Valley there. Uh, and Kentville, in fact, uh, is uh, Cynthia Bruce, who some of you may know, who uh, used to teach at Acadia, but now is teaching remotely from Kentville at Concordia. So, and of course we have two dogs as well to, to help us out and make things more interesting. Now, when it comes to sort of helping the community, you know, is that uh, there, there are provincial programs. Uh, there is a community accessibility program or community groups, not for profits, such as Churches and mosques uh, can apply for grants to improve accessibility. We have a business accessibility program, which is very generous. 
Uh, so that's going, it's a, it's a grant, it's a 75% grant program. For those who want to age in place or who have a disability, there are programs available to homeowners and landlords to retrofit existing buildings. And there is various resources available for, uh, for training as well. So, so that, that concludes uh, my presentation. And, 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 and I must say, you know, I, I've read your plan that's being proposed. And, uh, you know, in fact, I, I, I reread it this weekend and I almost became emotional just reading it. And, you know, this, it's amazing when you empower citizens and community what can happen and what came out was just, it's, it's really an example of, uh, of how things should be done. So I, I have to thank the council for supporting that whole initiative. And of course the staff and the consultants as well. A plus, wonderful job. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll stop there. All right, Jerry, thank you so much uh, for those uh, kind words. And uh, I must say that, uh, that your praise is, uh, is very high praise. Uh, for our plan and uh, uh, we are quite proud of, uh, of the entire group that uh, put this together, particularly our accessibility committee. Uh, have you got time for a couple questions? Oh yes. Okay, if, uh, if you stop sharing your screen, I'll be able to, uh, to see my Brady Bunch and uh, we'll get some questions for you. Okay, there we go. All right, does anyone have any questions uh, for, uh, for Jerry? All right, looks like you uh, you definitely hit the nail on the head. Jerry, I'm going to say the first time that I heard you speak, one of the stories you told was uh, just after you had left the hospital and you were at this point uh, in your chair and you were in an elevator and you looked at the buttons and, uh, you know, if you... you you couldn't reach the button that you wanted to reach from uh, from your chair, and uh, and I have to say that that was one of those moments when it was just like you know a, a very much an aha moment. Um, so uh, so thank you for all the aha moments that yeah. uh, that you have provided for us. Well, thank you very much. Well, that's an example where it's a design change that costs nothing, right? Exactly. And it, it, in fact, it helps everybody, including children. That's right, that's right. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Hi, Jerry, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I too heard you uh, in Truro a couple of years ago. Seems like forever ago since COVID, but um, your yeah, presentation was just as great tonight as it was back then. And, and I always learn more when I hear you speak. So just thank you for being an advocate for, for greater accessibility in, in our province. Uh, it's very appreciated, thank so. Thank, thank you, you very much, thank you. All right, uh, Jerry, we uh, are going to uh, move on now to uh, Laurel Taylor, who was uh, on our accessibility committee, and she's got a few words for us, I think. I do. Hi, thank Laurel. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Snow, town councillors, town staff, Jerry Post, good evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, and we are all treaties people. It is my privilege to serve as the committee chairperson for the Kenful Accessibility Advisory Committee and have done so since January 2020. I would like to acknowledge all committee members, past and present. Past members Robert Giles, former town councillor John Andrews, former town councillor Impulsiver, current members Vice Chair Cheryl Lake, Lamont and Mary Larkin, uh, Susan Harvey, Bernie Zink, Town Councillors Paula Huntley and Kathy Maxwell. And I also must acknowledge the support from the Town of Kenful staff, former CAO Brian Smith, uh, current uh, CAO Dan Troke, Beverly Gentleman, and certainly last but not least, Jennifer West and Rachel Beddingfield, who are a credit to this town. I come before you this evening in absolute joy and excitement to bring to Council a community-led, community-informed, and community-driven accessibility action plan for the Town of Kenful. This has been the culmination of a great deal of work by many individuals. And when I think back to the community committee's first meeting in January, 2020, which seems like a lifetime ago now, I'm amazed what this small but focused group has achieved. And when you add a global pandemic into the mix, it's even more admirable. In Nova Scotia, we have one of the highest rates of disabilities for people in Canada. Nearly one person in three lives with a disability. 
and disabilities can range in the area from physical, visual, hearing, mental health, intellectual, and learning disabilities. And I would remind everyone that not all disabilities are, visual, are visible to other individuals. During our very first meeting, we selected the chair and vice chair, and we introduced ourselves to each other, not just our names, but what brought us to be part of this committee, our hopes and our dreams for Kenful. And we had a plan before us, which was laid out by the province for us to follow. Our first task was to orient ourselves to the Accessibility Act. And to start this orientation, we had to do some reading and reading we did. After we completed all the reading, our second task was to create a statement of commitment, which we crafted and council approved. And I'm now gonna read that statement again, because I think it's worth reviewing. Our vision is for Kenful to be a healthy, vibrant, integrated, and welcoming community where all citizens and visitors can live and work and play in an environment that promotes a fulfilling quality of life. We acknowledge that currently there are barriers to achieving this vision. Through respectful engagement that honors the journeys of peoples with differing abilities and experiences, and through measurable outcomes that focus on equity, we will hold ourselves accountable to the Nova Scotia Accessibility Act. Kenfold's accessibility plan will guide the town in meeting the needs of all people who face barriers when accessing all that Kenfold has to offer. Kemphill is a town committed to fairness, dignity, and independence. I still get chills when I read it. The next stage of our committee's development was to learn together. And we achieved this by having various guest speakers, such as Jerry Post and Cynthia Bruce, who provided us a great deal of knowledge and understanding around accessibility and disability. And I can say their stories and observations were very insightful. And we also learned from each other on the committee sharing our stories, our observations, and our dreams for our community's future. Then our committee had to move on to create a plan for the town of Kenfall. And to achieve this task, we knew it was beyond our small but mighty group's ability. So with approved funding from the council, as part of the 2020 capital budget, we set out to hire a consulting firm to lead the process. An RFP was released with a list of various deliverables, which is outlined in your packages. And there were some very impressive submissions and we considered each very carefully. And in the end, we selected Houdini Architects. And once we did that, the real fun began. A large part of the task was to engage the community of Kenful regarding their views of accessibility and to help guide us um, through this public engagement process, we used the Medicine Wheel, a comprehensive tool created by Indigenous peoples, which looks at all interconnected systems. And through the medicine wheel, we take into account our relationship with the land. For example, during the Miners Marsh walk and roll engagement session, enabled enjoyment of the outdoors while the physical and emotional needs of the community were explored. There are nine pillars of accessibility and each pillar was assessed through the lens of inclusion and action and the medicine wheel framework. Um, and those pillars are goods and services, built environment, information and communication, awareness, transportation, education, employment, procurement, and human-centered design. And engage the community, we certainly did. More than 600 citizens of Kenful participated directly in engagement sessions. Those engagement sessions occurred with a survey kiosk, online and in person, and via phone. Stakeholders citizen engagement sessions, Zoom in, phone in, universal design and mapping exercises online and in person an art submission, school engagement at KCA, online survey. And I would remind everyone this occurred during the limitations of community movement during the global pandemic. The Kemphill Accessibility Action Plan was created in response to the priorities outlined by the province of Nova Scotia in the Access by Design 2030 legislation. The Kemphill Accessibility Plan charts the way forward as we work to create a more inclusive, accessible and welcoming community in Kemphill that exists and operates from a place of, case of, place of peace and friendship. Through the consultation process, we learned there was a strong desire for Kenful to be more welcoming and diverse. And we also heard the citizens of Kenful have an overwhelming sense of pride for their beautiful town and have many suggestions to share when it comes to making our community more accessible and welcoming. There are over 30 recommendations within the Kenful Accessibility Action Plan and those recommendations have been placed into the following categories, high priority, medium priority, 
low priority and opportunity based recommendations. And the details can be found in your attached documents and this one's titled Tenfold Accessibility Action Plan Priority Phasing. And these items were placed into categories based on their level of impact and perceived ease of implementation. We know Kempel will not become fully accessible overnight. That is not possible. However, if we follow this plan as a guide, we'll be well on our way to becoming accessible. I would also acknowledge the accessibility action plan is congruent with the town's active transportation plan. And with that kind of synergy, how can we go wrong? I hope you've had time to review the plan in its entirety. I know it's pretty big. It's a very impressive and valuable document for the town of Campbell to move forward towards full accessibility and inclusion for all its citizens. Can it be done? You bet it can. It's already started. I understand the town staff have already engaged in training in human rights. And if you review the uh, document itself, there are many uh, achievements Kempel has already done towards accessibility. Uh, do we have challenges ahead? I'm sure we do. But with the goal of full accessibility for all citizens, I'm sure those challenges will be met with determination to seek positive solutions. As you all know, this past year has been very challenging for many and many different ways. And we certainly cannot predict the future. This pandemic has taught us that. But it has also taught us that we are Nova Scotia strong. And part of that strength comes from caring for and including those who are not as able as we are. Let us be known as the community who cared enough for all its citizens to work towards full accessibility for all. It's not going to just be council or town staff. It's going to take all citizens to make this dream a reality. To quote directly from the Accessibility Action Plan itself, we cannot just respond to changes, but need to envision the change we want to be, plan for it, and act accordingly with the goal of sustainable, progressive, equitable future for all. The solutions to achieving accessibility and inclusion in the town of Kempel will require resources, human and capital, but they are within reach and have the capacity to be transformative for the town, its citizens and visitors. So the town of Kempel Accessibility Advisory Committee is making the following recommendation. That council receive and adopt the town of Kempel's accessibility action plan and further that council supports the implementation of the priority phasing recommendations, recognizing that implementation will fall within the approved budgetary process proposed annually. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Laurel. I just want you to know that we are going to take that motion to, uh, to our new business, which will give us the opportunity for a fulsome discussion. On behalf of council, the town staff and the town of Kentville, I want to thank you and the committee for your service to Kentville and to all the people who live here, who may choose to live here, who visit here. Um, they will truly get a sense of, uh, of what you have done, your committee, when I say you, I mean the committee uh, over, uh, over the coming years. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you from uh, the bottom of our hearts and, uh, and we will make this uh, happen. Uh, are there any questions uh, from members of council or comments? All right, well, to our guests, thank you very much uh, for the work and, uh, and for your presentations this evening. Uh, we will uh, be reviewing this again uh, during the new business uh, portion of this meeting. And uh, this document will become part of, uh, you know, what sits on the corner of our desk, but it's not actually just gonna sit there. It's, uh, it's going to become very warm. And uh, I can tell you that I've already started highlighting mine. And uh, I also have to say that uh, the next thing that uh, has to happen is, I'm trying to get it quickly, the amazing uh, cartoon that was done. I think we need to uh, have that poster uh, put up and uh, everybody, uh, you know, be able to see it. Now to the citizens of Kenville, if you're looking for a copy of this, it will be on our website and we will have printed copies available for people. They aren't available right now, uh, but once uh, we get back up and out of lockdown, they will be available uh, for you if, uh, if you so desire to have one. Councillor Zabian. Thanks, Your Worship. I love your enthusiasm. Just a little confused. We're gonna have discussion on this, right? 
Yes. Because you're making it sound like we've sealed the deal and moved forward. Uh, no, I was uh, expressing uh, my thanks, and uh, we okay. have a document here uh, that's uh, that's now part Maybe of. Maybe I missed on just the way I was sitting here. I was gazing, and I, it sounded like you were done. We were done, and there is no, discussion no, coming in. Uh, it's coming in new business. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right then. Again, thank you uh, to our guests, and uh, we are now moving on to our uh, department head uh, reports and recommendations. So the directors have provided their reports uh, for review uh, and are present if there are any questions. Uh, so we'll start with uh, finance, uh, Director Kroll. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm bringing a report for the month of April, April 30, 2021, first report for this fiscal year. Um, uh, before I get into that, though, I'd like to bring to you the, uh, the, the unaudited surplus positions for the town's funds. Um, I've got two of them in the report under the finance department update. The town of Kentville operating fund is looking at a surplus position of $312,357. The sanitary sewer area service ended the year with an unaudited current surplus of $106,733. And since I wrote this, the water utility has finalized its year end. It ended uh, the year with a $95,637 surplus of which $88,100 is going to be transferred into their capital reserve for future, future capital acquisition. So you'll see the water utility posting a $7,537 surplus at the end of March, 2021. For the town operating and for the sanitary sewer area service, we are required to transfer those surpluses into the town operating reserve fund. So those will go there and the town operating fund and the sanitary sewer operating fund will show a zero, uh, zero current surplus. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that good news uh, to council first. We're looking at the month of uh, April and we're looking at the 8.3% of the budget would be uh, received or consumed uh, if everything was averaged evenly over the year. Not much has happened in the revenue side of the ledger. We're looking at taxes. The interim tax bills have gone out. I'm sure you've all gotten yours. You're welcome. Um, I got mine too. Um, we're looking at taxation reporting at about 49% uh, of, the, of the current year. Uh, that's about the only thing that's happened on the revenue side of the ledger. On the expenditure side, we are looking at it being slightly over the benchmark at 9.1% expended. Uh, general administration exceeds the yardstick as 100% of the general insurance premium is paid and has been coded into that department at this time. Um, I received very late last week the, uh, the breakdown of the premium, so you'll see real reallocations going into the other departments and the other funds uh, over the next month or so. Um, under transportation services, environmental health services and recreation services, we have them also over the benchmark, but that is because of quarterly payments to our joint partners, King's Transit uh, quarterly payment, Valley Waste Resource quarterly payment, and the Annapolis Valley Regional Library quarterly payment. So that is why those, those sections are over. As I mentioned before, the interim taxes have been sent out. Uh, it, the, the interim taxes are due May 31st. Um, we're looking at a $4.9 million interim billing as compared to last year's $4.7 million. Outstanding at the end of April, $4.6 million as compared to about $4.7 million last year. Um, we'll, we'll provide all the graphs and information on outstanding taxes once the due date has uh, passed, which would be at the end of May. A sanitary sewer area service. Uh, I'm reporting on the year ended March 31st, 2021. And we're looking at the revenue being over target at 107.2% uh, received. And we're looking at the expenditure side of the ledger being at 99.2%. You can read my report on the third page. Um, we're looking at, as I mentioned before, a current surplus of 106,733 in the area service of which all of it will be transferred into the operating reserve. I've put in the capital investment plan. There is nothing in it right now except the budgets, but it's there and you'll see it populated as the year goes on. So that's my report. Excellent, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the director? No questions, thank you very much. Uh, director Gentleman, please. Good evening, everybody, um, your worship and council. Um, this is a report for the month of uh, April. 
Uh, 17 development permits were issued for a building valuation of 10.9, just over $10.9 million. And that brings our building valuations uh, to a year total of just over $16.8 million in development. We've had a few subdivision applications um, underway. Uh, Ryan's Park is proceeding well. Um, we are working with the developers right now in um, identifying their, their driveway names and civic addressing for the buildings. Um, <clears throat> for the civic addressing purposes, the roadways, though they're not town roadways, um, they're actually driveways, but they do have to have names and they do have to be identified um, for 911 purposes. Miners Landing, we uh, took out the final permit for the fourth building, so that is reflected within the uh, building valuation um, for this month. Uh, the River Street lands, the due diligence on the River Street property has been completed at the end of last month and uh, closing for the property on that uh, K2 lot is expected in, on the end of this month, uh, May, May 31st. Um, Stone Mount Retirement Group uh, and Catalyst, um, they've indicated that they are moving forward with an application uh, to submit some type of plan, LUB, Municipal Planning Strategy Amendment, um, to facilitate their seniors housing project on Park Street. At this time, I'm not sure what it is, what they're planning on doing. Um, but as of a week and a half ago, they uh, requested another application and I'm just waiting for them to submit that to see where they are heading with that. McDougall Heights uh, still having some problems with um, some of the paperwork from the legal department on the developer's side to get that final uh, plan of subdivision for those lots in uh, McDougall Heights. But we're hoping hopefully this week uh, we'll see something. Uh, the business park, obviously, there's uh, continued um, interest in that land. Um, and uh, as you are aware, on May, on uh, April 21st, uh, I met with you folks and we uh, went through some of the proposed housekeeping amendments for the LUB and MPS and one that uh, council has put forward that's kind of on the kind of on the cusp right now until we decide what's happening with Catalyst, if they want to move ahead with their own application. Uh, I don't know if two going ahead, depending on what Catalyst wishes to do, or what, they, um, what their proposal is, could be a little confusing. So I think within the next week, hopefully we'll have something so that on Thursday, May 20th, when we're having our public participation meeting, um, we'll have more concrete information in terms of which way we're going with that application. Um, <clears throat> staff has been helping out with the uh, recreation department on the dog park um, at, with um, um, submitting uh, a variance application for a permit with the uh, Department of uh, Agricultural uh, marshlands. Uh, we anticipate that that isn't going to be a problem at this time. It's just a formality that we need to go through. And there's a few site plans that staff's working with with different developers within town um, until we actually have something um, uh, concrete. Um, I'm not able to say much more, but there are some developments potentially that are going to be exciting in the future. So that's primarily my report. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have your hand up. Thank you, Worship. Hi, Director Gentlemen. Hi. Um, hi, so I just need a little bit of clarification. So the public participation meeting that we are having on May the 20th mm -hmm. is specific to the discussions that we had around the MPS and the LUB, and it, it won't be connected as, as such to any requests made by Stone Mount, correct? Correct, that would be a separate? Well, separate yeah. meeting? I'm just confused around that, thank you. So um, a lot of the, the amendments that I presented to, to you folks at council were things that um, uh, that we, we saw that needed to be addressed, some errors in 
in just uh, it's just some errors um, and uh, as part of the process of trying to address some of these housekeeping items uh, council submitted the uh, the prospect of moving ahead with changes to the MPS and LUB to allow for residential development within the uh, C2 zone. Mm -hmm. uh, if Catalyst is submitting an application to do the same, it doesn't make sense to have two different applications. So until I really know what Catalyst is proposing to do, um, I think we just give them so much time. And then I, I think it's also a discussion maybe I'll have to have with the CAO in terms of what direction to take with that. Um, but I think we have enough time to wait a week before we have the public participation meeting to see which way we're gonna go with it. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yes, somewhat. <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah, yes, but, it, but, but it's two, two different things, right? Like if, if we make some of those proposed change, or sorry, if we discuss some of those proposed changes in the public participation meeting, it isn't specific to Stone Mount i.e. catalyst. I'm just seeing Dan shake no, so it's not. It was pre precipitated by Stone Ridge. Sure. I, I think of a good uh, Mayor Snow. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe that uh, what you're saying is you're correct. Essentially, this is a conversation about all the C2 properties. And so if, uh, as part of this conversation, uh, this would have implications for potentially any property that's uh, zone C2. Um, and so again, this is the public participation part that would come back and then council could recognize that as uh, a potential decision across the entire C2 zoning. Okay. Um, the, the other conversation, which is site specific, uh, they may choose to go down that road, but I think uh, both of these, uh, and I think where director gentleman is going is that uh, once this conversation uh, it begins moving along, they may choose to follow this conversation around changes to C2 zoning versus their own individual. So there's a decision point and we'll try to get to that before we get to the public consultation. But there will continue to be some conversation around C2 zoning on, on the 20th, kind of regardless of where it is, it just may or may not impact the decision on that property. Okay, Th thank you to both of you. Thank you, Mayor Snow. All right, are there any further questions for Director Gentleman? None, all right, thank you very much, Director Gentleman. Thank all you. right, moving on to the Community Economic Development Coordinator's report. Are there any questions with regards to this report? Council Maxwell. There. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, wondering about the, uh, the Visitor Information Centre. It's looking pretty rough these days. Um, just wondering if we're going to get a paint job on there or not before, uh, before opening or anything. Yeah. Uh, oh, I guess maybe CAO can re relate to that as well. I know that there is, it's starting to, to look uh, a little... Um, a little bad and some some paint we could probably we don't have anything major in the budget this year for it but i think we could afford to to paint the outside to make it a little more presentable um in the event that we do open this year yeah that would be good <laughs> it would be yes okay thank you all right thank you very much moving on to uh, parks and recreation director bettingfield Good evening, Council. I'm just pulling up my notes here. Sorry. I'm just going to highlight a few things. I, um, I know a hot topic for everyone are the two bridges, update on the two bridges that uh, unfortunately um, one of them burnt down a few weeks ago. I think that was a few weeks ago. Time's irrelevant at this point. Um, we're still waiting uh, to hear back from insurance on that, but, um, but I've been working with the engineer to get updates on, on uh, estimates and things and what it will cost to um, replace them. So I'll make sure that council is updated as we move forward on that. Uh, under programs, our department has now added a SITSKI for adapted equipment loan program, 
which is really great uh, to have for next uh, season. Hopefully there's no more snow. Hopefully there's no more snow this year that we'll need a sit ski, but um, we're quite excited for it. Um, also as part of the work on the Provincial Accessibility Committee that I sit on, we're also uh, looking at making um, uh, just training opportunities and videos on how to support uh, community recreation departments across the province in working with folks who have mobility issues who may want to use this adaptive equipment. So that's part of a larger piece as well. Um, under operations, we've received uh, a number of applications when it came to all of our summer staff and we have since called back and, and done interviews. Um, so slowly we're putting together our team for the, hopefully have one of the best summers ever in spite of everything. We're quite excited about that. Um, under community events, uh, community members, um, uh, as with public health and Dr. Strang's comments, are continued to encourage and encourage to use our parks and trails as much as possible while following uh, the public health protocols and restrictions and keeping distance. But that's what they're there for. And we just encourage people to get out as much as possible. Uh, we do have a current uh, community-wide scavenger hunt going on right now on our trails and we'll continue to do things to, to get people out and interested in nature. Um, uh, Ashley worked really hard on our volunteer awards. They were canceled provincially, but we still held them locally like a number of other municipalities. Uh, you can see in my report a list of the volunteer award winners, including our council's very own Julian York. Uh, who was a nominee as well. So congratulations to everyone. Uh, and the last piece I wanted to talk about under grants, you can see a number of grants that we have in right now, um, including a community accessibility grant that we've applied for in the hopes that we are able to purchase Moby mats. And Moby mats are those things that uh, folks often see when they, when they line the beach to go to the water to make sure everyone can access it. We don't have a beach and I'm not asking you to build me a beach. I appreciate it though. Um, but we do want to make sure that people can access all of our parks when we have events and opportunities. So um, <clears throat> we're going to change the, the name from Moby Matt to, to uh, Pathway to Play, and we're hoping that everybody can come and participate in all that we have to offer in what's sure to be a great summer. And that's my report. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor York. Thank you. Um, so I'm sorry, Director Benningfield, but I have been asked several times and I'm, I know you likely have been asked as well, um, but I have some questions about day camp, when it's mm -hmm. planned to be open and what it's going to look like, if it's going to be half day sessions or whole day sessions, and if you have a sense of what the group sizing might look like. No, probably not because it's crazy times at the moment, but <laughs> I, so, I said I would ask. Uh, until restrictions are, are changed, otherwise we're planning to go back to full day. Uh, we are keeping the cohorts small. I think that's something that we'll continue to do. Um, and we are also adding a leader in training program so that each, each camp has a youth uh, who can help build their leadership skills and also support um, uh, the other campers and the leaders. And then we've also added a specialty uh, uh, program for older or for younger youth, so I guess 12 to 15 years old, um, where those programs are normally half day, sometimes full day, depending on, on um, the, the specialty topic. And it's everywhere from art to activism, to biking skills, to uh, wh whatever it is you name it, we'll have five of those. And then um, another piece that was really popular last summer was our, our uh, leisure ed workshop series. So everything from wood whittling to drumming to hula hooping to all of those things in the park. And we're going to have our staff uh, focus on reaching out to neighborhoods and we'll have our equipment loan program and it's going to be a really great summer if everybody could just stay home. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really encouraged to see the activism in involved in the camp at like the youth level. That's incredible. Congratulations to your staff. That's that was not an idea. That's the youth themselves. They're much more engaged than I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Zavian. Your Worship. Uh, directing Director Bedingfield, just wondering if there's any update or I know it's been a couple of years since anybody asked about the uh, digital screens that we had. Do we still have that equipment and is it salvageable or not? Uh, no, and there may be someone uh, around this table that's better able to answer that, but I uh, know those pieces of equipment were taken down a while ago and they... Right. Um, unfortunately have been damaged and um, also the company that was repairing them is no longer in business so unfortunately they're not. I remember the last time somebody had asked you a couple of years ago you said it needed a part or something but they were semi-salvageable I think then but mm. uh, okay I maybe CAO can look into that and see 
Thank you. Councilor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, pass on a heaps of uh, congratulations and thanks to your staff, Rachel, for um, the initiative and the ingenuity to organize scavenger hunt and other <laughs> outdoor activities. Um, for our citizens, it's timely right now with, with COVID and people being asked to stay home. And I have spotted some of those scavenger hunt uh, cards when I've been out around and, and uh, I'm sure it's a, a fairly popular activity, especially with students at home right now. So, you know, really a, a lot of thanks for, for them doing something like that to get people outside. Thank I will you. certainly, I will certainly pass that on. And just so councillor is aware, council is aware, um, we do a few initiatives for the general public. We spend a lot of time reaching out to a lot of the community groups, including the school, uh, to ensure that those um, those folks who are, have higher needs um, have what they need. So, um, so we are reaching out to make sure that um, people know that we're there for them, and yeah, yeah, we're we're here to serve as much as possible. All right, thank you very much for that report. And moving on to the police uh, report, uh, Police Commission Chair Gerard, do you have anything to add or um, is there anything that you want to say about this report? There is not, however, if anybody has any questions about it, I will try my darndest to, uh, to answer them. All right, Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, our bylaw officer um, has been keeping an eye on the, the courtyard uh, to make sure social distancing is being followed at the, uh, the picnic tables. Um, I've heard some social media complaints uh, in that area and just wondering if that's something that's been discussed. And Which courtyard? <laughs> Center Square. I'm going to call it the courtyard, I guess. Okay, um, that I have no idea. I uh, I don't know whether I don't even know whether that's a bylaws uh, officer thing. I I assume. Oh, Dan, go ahead. Sorry. No, thank you. So um, I did have a couple of conversations with the bylaw officer. Um, it was uh, actually last Monday and and last Wednesday. He uh, and I can't speak specifically to that case, but I do know as part of his rounds uh he was talking to individuals about social distancing and and obviously uh, you know encouraging people to be uh, keeping their distance i can i can find out specifically around your question and i'll get back to you but i have seen him and have had conversations with him where i know he is going and asking people or just reminding people that they should be keeping uh their six feet apart but i'll follow up on that specific one and uh and see i'll get an answer back to you Okay, thank you. I'm also wondering if uh, Kempo Police Service has uh, been issuing any tickets under the Quarantine Act and the Health Protection Act. Um, if we've done, if we've had any issued or so on. To my knowledge, there hasn't been, uh, but that's, uh, like I said, I, I have not had an opportunity today to speak with the chief, but at this moment, I'm not aware of any. Okay, and my final question was that I noticed that the provincial statutes were um, up uh, in, uh, in, in the uh, report by the chief. I'm wondering what, uh, what statues are being broken that would cause that increase to take place. That would for sure be one. Uh, we haven't had a, uh, a police commission meeting, so she's not said um, anything, anything specific. I've not met with her, so that would be something you would have to ask uh, her directly. Um, where where do you see that actually? It's under provincial statutes in the report. It shows uh, it shows yep. uh, the statutes this month are being much higher than previous. And so yep. I was just wondering yep. what caused the increase there. Yep, that that would be something you would have to ask the chief. Okay, thank you. All right, nothing further on that report. We will move on to engineering and public works uh, with Director Bell, please. Good evening, Your Worship and Council. Um, just give you a, a brief uh, highlight of my report for uh, the month of April. Now that uh, all capital budgets have been ratified, we are busy getting uh, working to get our capital projects out to tender, uh, some of which will be coming out in the next, in the next week or two. 
Um, our newest public works employee, Josh Prow, started at the end of April in the downtown maintenance position. So you'll see Josh around town helping keep it clean. Um, under public works, uh, lime painting and concrete repair has begun in the downtown area uh, by public works crews and the lime painting truck uh, is scheduled to be out uh, around town in late May. That's the truck we hire every year to come in and paint the, uh, the, main, the main lines, yellow and white lines throughout town. Patch paving tenders closed um, April 29th, and we had three uh, tenders submitted, and the successful bidder was Dexter Construction. So patching uh, will begin will begin in the next uh, two weeks, roughly, once the uh, the plants are open. Um, usually, the first round is done um, pre apple blossom time. No apple blossom, of course, this year, but uh, but done the la the latter part of of, uh, of May in the downtown, and then. Uh, in, in June around in the subdivisions and then uh, again downtown later in the uh, in the late summer. Um, underwater commission, the Belcher Street tank, uh, water tank is currently drained and offline for repairs and scheduled maintenance. Um, actually the crew were on site today, um, a Nova Scotia crew, so they're considered essential, essential workers, so they're allowed to come to work on the tank. Uh, we drained it last week to take it out of service. Um, and the utility customers in this area will continue to, to have water as normal <clears throat> with no expected interruptions and the tank will be, be back online. We'll start filling it uh, tomorrow morning. Um, I mentioned before about uh, us switching caustic soda. I won't get into that again tonight. That's in my report, but uh, we've, we've changed that chemical with uh, expectations of, uh, of greatly reduced maintenance costs and service interruptions. Under sanitary sewer utility, um, Kings County, um, part of the regional sewer uh, committee, they tendered a capital works project that closed in April uh, as part of ongoing upgrades to the regional plant where all of our waste uh, ultimately is pumped. This uh, phase included the sludging of the first two primary cells at the plant. Um, facilities that accept this bio waste are few and the closest is actually in New Brunswick. So the three tenders received ranged from uh, 3.5 to 4.8 million dollars with a budgeted amount of only 2.2 million. So uh, the project obviously won't be going forward at this time. They're going to make uh, application for, for grant, uh, some funding, to see if anything's available for funding and, and likely be deferred at least a year until, uh, until they can get some, some additional funding and potentially increase the budget as well in, uh, in a future year. And those are the highlights of my report. Any questions? Excellent, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Director Bell, I, I knew uh, about the, the de-sludging project and that one of the, um, one of the quotes had come in um, unusually high. I didn't know that the other one came in even higher. Um, mm -hmm. What's, and I know this is something that, that they had the folks around to sort of see how much had to be done and, and sort of what would be involved. So obviously it's far more than, than we expected. And so I'm just wondering with respect to the grant, if that's looking good or if they probably, or if they will come back to the respective partners um, for, for some of the shortfall. I just know from the meetings that mm -hmm. they, they probably can't put it off for too, too long. Anyway, I keep answering my own question. So go ahead, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we, we had a, a technical subcommittee meeting a few weeks ago to discuss some options. And of course, you know, the, one option would be to come back to the partners, but oh. uh, you know, I think everybody there realized that wasn't really a, a you know, anything that was gonna, gonna uh, turn out in, in their favor, uh, being that much over budget. The low, the low tender being, you know, 1.3 over their budget um, was a little suspect. They don't know much about this company. They're from Texas. They had a lot of clauses in their in their contract that could easily, you know, uh, find their ways into extras and make that budget or make that tender price be as much as the as the higher you know the higher one. So they have to be careful with that with that low price. I mean, low is it was low of the three, but still greatly over over right. the budget. Right. I was I was quite you know I had my doubts that it was gonna come in on budget anyway from what I had seen and what they, how they were proposing. In fact, that it had to be trucked, trucked mm -hmm. all the way to New Brunswick. You know, we, we looked right. at other options. Can something be set up in Nova Scotia? It's almost like starting a, a whole other company that would treat. There's really nobody to service all the, uh, 
the ponds or lagoons in Western Nova Scotia. Halifax Regional has, has a small facility, but they only accept waste from Halifax area um, plants and I think the, uh, perhaps the airport. But um, there's not, nothing in this part of the, pro nothing in any, anywhere else in the province for that matter. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that was one thing that was sort of brainstormed. Could, could a, if a company was to start up, uh, could that be treated or, or dealt with, um, with less, less trucking costs? But to, to haul all that away to New Brunswick, I'm not surprised that it was, you know, so over budget. Yeah. But, okay. um, you know, the only real feasible thing to do would be to uh, apply for grants. They haven't even applied for, I don't think there's anything available at this moment. So mm -hmm. I suspect it'll be deferred a full, a full calendar year, fiscal year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, Director Bill, I have a couple of questions here. Um, has there been any discussion or any plan put in place to clean up the the grass between Belcher Street and the sidewalk that was such a mess uh, when they replaced that the sidewalk there. The corner, the going up at the lights, going up the hill at Belcher, uh, yeah, Councilor Maxwell. Yeah, yeah, mostly the, the new sidewalk all along the new sidewalk there, um, coming down from Me Road all, all the way down to uh, oh, Oak Dean. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was thinking you're talking about the new, the new, new one from from. From the bridge work last summer you're not you're referring to the sidewalk from three two two yeah, plus years yeah. ago yeah. going on th going on three years i suppose yeah um right. yeah we've talked about it a few times and i know um the contractor uh, we weren't satisfied with their reinstatement so we withheld um the equivalent you know the cost of what they had in for for that sod so they were never paid for that amount um, they've asked for it a couple of times and we've told them it wasn't replaced to our satisfaction. If they didn't want to want to do it, we would do it with, with that money, which I guess this is the summer to do it. So uh, it. we will get so. it done. We will get it, it done. It would be nice to get it done. It would yes. be nice to get it done if we can, because it's really a, a an eyesore, uh, entering town from, from that end. Um, those weeds come up really high and not only are they on the, the meridian between the, the the street and the and the sidewalk, but they're also growing up on the street, <laughs> between the street and the and the curb. So it's a, it you know it's a real it's a real mess there. It is my my recommendation would be perhaps to have it tilled up and 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 hydro seeded. I think it probably would take better and last longer than sod. Sod looks great for for a year or two, and then yeah. the salt, of course, salt does a number on it and and lots of things, but just doesn't seem to be as hardy. I mean, it still looks great out on out on Park Street where the new sidewalk is, but um, we know what happens after a couple seasons. So, my recommendation would be to to hydro seed that area, and uh, yeah. that's something we can we can do because uh, they they've been told that their that their uh, call it their their final holdback wouldn't be released uh, unless they repaired it, and they have chosen not to by yeah. by uh, by having no answer. So it's exactly. considered we'll we'll take care of it. Yeah. Okay, and um, another uh, question is, I'm sure we're gonna be doing some repainting of sidewalk, um, crosswalks around town. Basically all of them, they, they, they seem to only last, not, not even last a year. Uh, it's the, the environmental paint. I'm not sure what the right, right, the right answer is. It's, it's the best line painting, outdoor pavement paint we can get, but it doesn't seem to even last a full 12 months, but uh, they're, they're working on, on those now. They painted, um, many of the handicapped spots, accessible spots, I should say, barrier-free spots um, last week and uh, are working on, have done a few of the crosswalks, but they're, they're next on the list before, before the, um, the, the big paint truck comes through town at the end right. of May. So um, could you uh, remind them that uh, there are some crosswalks, pretty important ones up off Cornwall Street going on to Exhibition Street and across from the food land that uh, probably need some sprucing up yeah, I know the one that the the sort of the four way of, of uh, yeah. exhibition where the where the uh, the diner is was done um, latter part of the summer because actually we had to get traffic control such a busy spot up there it's even not not safe for our own guys to do it so we actually right. had to do, very few times do we need traffic control for for crosswalk painting but that's that's one of the spots but also yeah. up farther by the food land is that what you said I think as well? so. the last time I was across uh, was. Uh, in the winter and it didn't look great, but, but I'm not yeah. sure. You'd have to just go up and take a look at it, I think. Absolutely, no, we'll do that. But essentially they'll, they go around and check, check all, all crosswalks, um, particularly the ones that are true crosswalks. I mean, there's, there's some at the end of, 
of a stop sign, which to me are right. less less critical. You know, they could even be. Um, we've gone kind of gone to the the standard of I call it tiger stripe painting, but the ones at the end of say Church Street by Town Hall or somewhere, those could almost be you know the the more traditional parallel lines because it is as a stop sign. You have to come to a stop and and yield to pedestrians um, as it is. But certainly on any of the main crossings, we do uh, we do try to do yearly. But uh, my last, my last question is, uh, uh, it's a, probably a, a pain in, the, in your butt, but um, I've been getting a lot of uh, comments on the poles, the, those metal poles on Mountain View, Hillcrest, up in the Palmetter subdivision, uh, any of our older subdivisions that are really looking bad, like they're really rusted and it's making the, those neighborhoods um, really you know, not look like very nice, nice neighborhoods. And uh, I don't know who owns them. I've, you know, I've been told Nova Scotia Power, I've been told Town of Kenfall, just, I wonder if this is something that we can pursue a little more thoroughly. I will pursue it. It's my understanding, like with all new subdivisions, um, the one that uh, the, the director gentleman mentioned, um, with Dougal Heights, like we, we turn those over, they become the property of NS Power. So they, you know, we, the developer pays for them when they're new. We, we own them for day, essentially a day and turn them directly over to NS Power because they have, there's some weird uh, um, clause. It's not why we do it, but there's some, some weird thing where they're not necessarily CSA approved, but uh, because Nova Scotia Power is the utility, they can, they can turn them on. But if we own them, they wouldn't energize them. And it's just a bizarre thing. I don't even, I shouldn't have even brought it up. But uh, um, I understand, you know, I'm sure the old ones war, were, Kenville Electrics back in the day, like up on uh, James Mountain View and Palmer Subdivision and all those places were Kenville Electric. Uh, to me, those were, would have been turned over to, to Nova Scotia Power, um, much like any of the, of the poles in town, whether they're wooden light poles or, or light standards, but I can, uh, I can find that out for sure. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. I'm getting a lot of citizens coming after me about that. And I think it was also brought up during the election as well. And uh, they, they are approaching the end of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're looking really bad, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is there anything further for the director? All right, thank you very much, Director Bell. And moving on to CAO Trope, please. Thank you very much, Mayor Snow. And uh, just a couple items I'll, I'll highlight. And earlier, you, uh, you obviously heard Director Gentleman talking about land, there is still lots of interest in the properties that the town has left and uh, some back and forth with some potential uh, opportunities there. So obviously as we get them, we'll be bringing them forward to council for consideration. Uh, the public health order, obviously once that was put into place, uh, we closed town uh, hall to uh, outside uh, individuals and we reduced the number of staff in town hall. Um, once the uh, provincial order allows, we certainly will open up immediately to public. Uh, but in the meantime, obviously encouraging folks to make payments either electronically or via the Dropbox at, uh, at the town office. Um, and also there's a number of protocols been put in place uh, with regards to our teams who, are, who do have to work closely together, uh, particularly in, in, in water and within public works. So those are in place in order to make sure that everybody is, is working safely. With regards to the budget uh, and after the budget was passed, the, the next step would be to get the grants applications uh, processed. So we're gonna be uh, getting together. Uh, we were hoping to do it in person, but we'll evaluate that as time goes on um, and hopefully be able to work through the, um, the grants applications process. Um, the accessibility presentation, which was today, and obviously various components of, of accessibility um, are already part of our, our capital uh, asset mass, our capital asset planning process, but also uh, already part of the um, active transportation pieces that are, that are on the way. The intermunicipal service agreement review, uh, first meetings were had and there's continuing meetings coming up later this month with regards to legal review and so on. Uh, the municipal planning strategy, um, basically May 20th will be the opportunity to start receiving feedback. Uh, we'll both be receiving individuals who can write in to be part of the process, but also an opportunity on the 20th to participate in a live, uh, a live call. 
Uh, Mentoring Plus, uh, there's a number of activities were going on where they were working closely with New Glasgow. New Glasgow, of course, in this is about a year ahead in the process versus the other sites. Um, but essentially, again, with the pandemic, much of what they've done is now gone to a virtual platform. Um, they are trying to continue with their meetings via Zoom. And some of their sessions that they had with their high schools have been pushed forward a season um, and just in order to try and continue with them. Um, essentially, everything in my world that we're in person meetings have now gone to virtual meetings. Um, and so all everything that's in the calendar just flipped. So uh, essentially, uh, most of most of my days are, are, are working out that direction. And just as a quick follow up to Councillor Maxwell's question with regards to the statutory the reason for the increases is this is essentially radar checks that are going on here in town. So um, they're doing with the radar checks, they're also doing vehicle checks. And so just uh, we, uh, we've increased the numbers and therefore the, uh, as a result, the, the hits you see on that line are higher than they were in the month before. Yep. And that's my report. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other questions uh, for the CAO? Nothing. All right, then moving along. So we will accept a motion, uh, a motion to accept the staff reports as presented. A move. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And seconder. Councillor Huntley, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that staff reports be accepted as presented. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you. All right, moving on to our unfinished business. Uh, the first item or the only item under unfinished business, business arising is uh, comments uh, for policy revision G28 grants to organization. So after our last meeting, you were provided with a, a red line copy of, uh, of the proposed changes to the grants to organizations. Are there any further changes uh, that you've seen but have not submitted uh, to, uh, to Recording Secretary uh, West? Nothing, all right then. Uh, uh, we're prepared to make a recommendation. Uh, the CAC recommend approval to Town Council of the amendment to the G28 Grants to Organization policy at the May 31st, 2021 Council meeting. Deputy Mayor. And a seconder. Councillor Huntley, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that CAC recommend approval to Town Council of the amendments to the G28 Grants to Organization Policy at the May 31st, 2021 Council meeting. Is there any discussion on this matter? Solicitor. Um, 4.6 and 4.7. I'm just trying to pull them up here again. Okay. Um, uh, may not be totally consistent anymore with the intent. I just wanted to uh, bring those two uh, sections to your attention just to uh, ensure that council had turned its mind to them. So 4.6, you mean the new 4.6? Yes. So only one application per organization per fiscal, the town's fiscal run successful applications. So that is still correct? So the emergency application can't be a second one. There's still only no. one. No, still okay. only one application per group. Yes. So just, just to use a live example, if a organization that is funded um, needs more money, um, the, perhaps because they've spent more at the rink than they anticipated, they can't come back and ask for more under this policy. That was not the intent, no. Okay, just wanted to make sure. No. And I don't recall what 4.7 was. 4.7 was application. All applicants must complete the standard application and budget forms provide, provide all required documentation for evaluation. Incomplete applications will be disqualified and returned to the applicants without being evaluated or considered. So the rules still apply, it's just that- Sorry, I thought 4.7 had an A and a B perhaps, the new 4.7. Okay, um, so there may be a requirement to present to council is the A right. and the B is the maximum amount available through this program is 2000 per fiscal. 
those don't change. Yes, no, they wouldn't. I may have the wrong reference, sorry. I have it here in front of me now. Oh yes, sorry, it, it's the maximum part that I was thinking of, 7.2. So um, if, if there's only one, then 7.2 clearly doesn't apply. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other, uh, or is there any further discussion on this matter? Okay, the question, the question is that CAC recommends approval to town council of the amendments to the G28 grants to organization policy at the May 31st, 2021 council meeting. Deputy Mayor, how say you? Yes. Councilor Gerard? Yes. Councilor Huntley? Yes. Councilor Maxwell? Yes. Councilor York? Yes. Councilor Zabian? Yes. And I say yes, the motion is carried. All right, moving right along to our correspondence. Uh, so the first item of correspondence that we had was a letter from the uh, Meadowview Community Centre with regards to the bridge that burnt down. And uh, I did speak directly to Joe Benjamin to inform him that uh, we were awaiting information from our um, insurance provider. And he was satisfied with that. And I mentioned that the, uh, um, the petition and the letter would be coming before council and, uh, and that it was our intent uh, to, um, to make uh, repairs uh, to the bridge. And, uh, and I followed up with, uh, with Director Bedingfield uh, with regards to this, and we will keep them informed as, uh, as we go along. And the next piece of correspondence was uh, a really nice email from uh, Ken Harrison with, uh, with regards to the uh, um, nature, Nova Scotia Nature Trust and uh, our uh, ravine. So uh, they, uh, they continue to be very interested. There are ongoing meetings and, uh, and they're actually having a meeting uh, within uh, the next couple of weeks uh, with the New Minas area and Kings County. So uh, we will uh, keep abreast of, uh, of this information. All right, moving on to our first item of new business. It's the Kings Remo uh, Regional Emergency Management Plan. And uh, uh, CAO Troke, if uh, you could uh, give us the, uh, the high level brief on this one, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, thank you very much, Mayor Snow. So in everyone's package, uh, you're going to see a, it's a 44 page document. Um, and what I'll draw your attention to is, is really essentially the, the nuts and bolts here is that on page 10, uh, or would be on page 117 of the total package, um, it outlines what the priorities are of Remo essentially um, during an emergency. So kind of when you get to the nuts and bolts of, of what the plan is about, these are the kinds of things, and then decision trees take you out from there. There's a requirement under this plan to do an annual update. And so in essence, that's what today is. But in addition to some of those housekeeping uh, matters, there is a couple of changes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch base on them. Uh, so first of all, um, that uh, in Article 5.1.9, they have, uh, we've always had a provision with regards to an epidemic. Uh, of course, we now live in a world of a pandemic. So there had to be a need to add pandemic uh, to the plan because other than that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be touched uh, under, under the plan. Um, and also uh, in 5.4.10, there are some changes. And obviously over time, as we have provincial department names change, we have to update the plan. So in this case, um, we had to include for the Department of Transportation, now active transit as, as part of their title. Um, and there was also some new signatures within this plan. So obviously the town of Wolfville as the mayor has a, is a new signatory. Um, and, and also, uh, I think one of, the, one of the key pieces here is that um, this comes back to councils on an annual basis. What's being proposed is that effectively under 7.1 in this plan is that there's going to now be a committee. And, and this committee will have two councillors from each of the uh, signatories. 
along with the CAO of Kings and the emergency uh, remo coordinator, the regional emergency management organization coordinator, um, that effectively they will get the report each year. And if there's any of the subtle updates and changes need to happen, they would have the authority to make that. And therefore anything that would need to potentially come back um, beyond that committee would come back from the councillors who sit on that committee um, and, and inform the rest of council. So it's just kind of to expedite um, and, and to make sure that the simple things like name changes or, or even address changes. So for example, the uh, emergency measures primary location is now located at 181 Colebrook Village Park Drive. That's a change that technically right now would have to come back to council and in the world going forward that this would be one where we would um, just simply have to make that recommendation by the committee and the documents would be updated. Uh, the only other piece I'll pass along to council is that there is a 24 hour, seven day emergency measures uh, officer in place with a with a 1-800 number. So if anybody's looking for that information, certainly it's in this document, but also happy if folks have specifics that they wanna uh, plug into their phones or have on speed dial, please let me know and we'll get you any and all of that contact information. So most of this is housekeeping, but the one significant change really is about that this committee would kind of take over these housekeeping items going forward. And that, uh, you know, obviously Kenful would need to be putting forward representatives to represent on that committee. And Mayor Snow, in essence, those are the highlights of the changes uh, in the document before council tonight. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions with regards to, uh, to any of those uh, changes? Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, uh, the representation on that committee now uh, for the time being would be yourself and myself. Correct or are those or is that changing? That's correct. Okay, That's thank so. you. Thank you. All right. If uh, if there are no uh, questions, then we do have uh, a recommendation from the Remo Advisory Committee that CAC recommend approval to Town Council of the Draft Change One to the Kings Regional Emergency Management Plan dated March 2021 at the 31st of May 2021 Council meeting. If someone could move that, please. Councillor Maxwell, thank you. Councillor Zabian for the second, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that CAC recommend approval to Town Council of the Draft Change 1 to the King's Regional Emergency Management Plan dated March 2021 at the 31st of May 2021 Council meeting. Is there any discussion on this matter? Are you ready for the question? The question is that CAC recommends approval to Town Council of the Draft Change 1 to the King's Regional Emergency Management Plan dated March 2021 at the 31st of May 2021 Council meeting. Deputy Mayor, how say you? Yes. Councillor Gerard? Yes. Councillor Huntley? Yes. Councillor Maxwell? Yes. Councillor York? Yes. Councillor Zabian? Yes. And I say yes, the motion is carried. All right, moving on to our next piece of, uh, of business. Uh, we have a revision to the alternate voting uh, bylaw. CAO Trope, could you talk us through this one? Sure. Um, so in essence, uh, most municipal units um, had in place or put in place uh, an, an ability to have an alternative form of voting. And so Kent Folk does not have this provision. Um, and so in essence, what we're looking to do is add that. So in the event of an election, there's a requirement for um, alternative voting. And of course, that can be either uh, via uh, an electronic computer form or a telephone form because the telephone form is, is, is used as, as a secondary item and often in many communities used as their primary method for folks to be able to get through when these are enacted. And so in essence, this, this change would allow the town of Kenfold to introduce that. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it will be used in each and every one, but it gives the ability to do so. So in essence, in the last uh, election without that provision there, you really can't go down the road of anything but paper. And so this gives the, the council the ability on the go forward to be able to offer that as a potential service and whether it's for pandemic or just become part of the desire in order to include uh, more methods uh, for voting. 
All right. Are there any questions uh, with regards to that uh, solicitor? I just add that uh, for those who know Al Kingsbury's long standing involvement with the town um, and, and its elections, I have no idea how many he's overseen on behalf of the town of Kentville, but it's been many. And he's probably one of the um, more experienced people in the province when it comes to running municipal elections. He was a key part of this and, uh, and he should be acknowledged and thanked for his input um, with us on uh, one formal meeting and follow-ups with him. And he had some very good comments and input around that. And uh, I dare say that if the town adopts this, it will probably have one of the better, if not the best form of bylaw in the province on these issues. Excellent, thank you so much for that uh, solicitor. Uh, and Al, thank you for all you do for us. So we do have a recommendation coming out of this and uh, from that emotion that CAC recommend first reading to town council of the chapter 104 alternate vote voting bylaw at the 31st of May 2021 council meeting and further that council gives second reading to this bylaw at the 28th of June 2021 council meeting. If someone could move that please. Councillor Hudley and York for the second, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that CAC recommend first reading to town council of the chapter 104 alternate voting bylaw at the 31st of May, 2021 council meeting. And further that council give second reading to this bylaw at the 28th of June, 2021 council meeting. Is there any discussion on this matter? There being no discussion, are you ready for the question? The question is for CAC to recommend first reading to Town Council of the Chapter 104 Alternate Vote Bylaw at the 31st of May 2021 Council meeting and further that Council give second reading to this bylaw at the 28th of June 2021 Council meeting. Deputy Mayor, how say you? Yeah. Councillor Gerard? Yes. Councillor Huntley? Yes. Councillor Maxwell? Yes. Councillor York? Yes. Councillor Zabian? Yes. And I say yes, the motion is carried. All right, our next piece of business, uh, you've, uh, you've heard from, uh, from our presenters this evening and uh, Director Bettingfield, if you could uh, give us a little highlight here uh, before uh, we move on to the recommendation. Um, I don't really know what else I can say other than what has already been said. Uh, this plan had a lot of community input. It was driven by a community uh, a community committee, a, com a committee of council. Um, yeah, I think Laurel spoke ex excellent, as did Jerry. And uh, I'm here to answer any questions or any concerns. All right, then let's get the motion on the table before uh, we go into discussion. So we do have a recommendation that CAC recommend approval to town council of receipt and adoption of the town of Kentville accessibility action plan. And further that council support the implementation of the priority phasing recommendations recognizing that full implement implementation will fall with the approved budgetary process proposed annually at the 31st of May 2021 Council meeting. If someone could move that please. Councillor York, thank you. And for the second, Councillor Maxwell, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that CAC recommend approval to Town Council of receipt and adoption of the Town of Kentville Accessibility Action Plan and further that Council support the implementation of priority phasing recommendations recognizing that full implementation will fall with the approved budgetary process proposed annually at the 31st of May 2021 Council meeting. Discussion or questions for, uh, for the Director. Councillor Zabian. Thank you, Your Worship. Just um, Director Bettingfield, I, I look at this report and it's, it's done well. I'm just wondering um, in here, some of these recommendations, are they, are you looking to have all of these things done or is it more, some of them are wish lists? I'm just, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Like there's um, where it says that parking for downtown really should be at the perimeter and there should be a parkade established. Um, I guess I'm just looking for clarity on how that's 
the way it's illustrated there is kind of like, we'd like to do this, but how are you going to do it? And a little more clarity on, on some of those comments. Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, one is, and this is why the recommendation was worded that way. So any project uh, that is listed here, we, we still need to bring in front of council and council still has to approve much like the AT plan, much like any of those, those other pieces. But that's a really good example of one that is gonna take a lot of thought. So the recommendations are, are primarily, uh, they come from you know, what we heard in the community and what uh, what um, what folks would like to see for their town, um, but then as a committee, we need to come together and figure out um, you know the best way to implement what are what are they actually meaning by that. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation about this one and that item in particular, Councillor Zabian. Um, you know what does that look like uh, for a small town like like Kenfo? Um, so what I can tell you is that before any of these move forward, they will need to be brought forward to council with, I would argue, a larger, you know, a, a larger think tank behind them around what this actually means. Uh, you know, when we were going through it, we took a look at each one of the recommendations and, and said, okay, this is, this is really interesting that people, um, for example, are saying that we need to make sure that our website is accessible. Our website is accessible and it meets those standards, but obviously, what they're trying to tell us is that they don't know about that and we need to do a better job of letting folks know. So that's, uh, you know, the committee has already started to, to pick apart and, and what does this look like and how does it meet the, the ultimate goal of creating an accessible Kenfo. So I guess uh, my question is, um, thanks for that. Are all those recommendations gonna come before us? In is that what you're saying? Or you will pick and choose which ones in that year you feel, like, are you looking to have this whole package completed or I guess, there's a lot in there and I'm trying to figure out, it almost, to me and I, and it's, I mean, I appreciate the work involved in it. It looks like a wish list kind of, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I guess, yeah, it's, I, and I think I had asked this back a few months ago. I understand the reasoning behind it and I respect and appreciate that. And I think that's great for Kenful, but it, it looks like wishes and I'm just, yeah. How will you know when to come and when, which ones to pick to present, I guess. Well, we can't. So uh, it's 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 the committee. It's not me, though. I do right. like when people think that everything is mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's not just up to me. Um, uh, but whenever money is involved, we need to bring it to council, right? So we can't with, with mm -hmm. outside of the fiscal budget that you folks approve. We need to bring it here. Um, but also the uh, the way that things are prioritized under high priority, medium priority, low priority and opportunity-based recommendations. Those are based on the things that can have the largest impact and also the things that are required within the legislation. Mm -hmm. So um, those will obviously be, be top priority. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilor Gerard. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat as, uh, as Councilor Zabian. You, I've, I've made it through most of the, uh, of the plan and it gets very confusing when you start throwing active transportation in with accessibility. And I, I think it's very preemptive to say we all, we're all on board, which we are on board with this, but without a price tag coming with this, um, I'm, I'm not anywhere near at a point where, um, where, where I, I would wanna move this forward. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of what if we do this and we, we, we could do this or that, um, the, you know, the, the taking, uh, all the parking away downtown and, and putting, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with everything that's in the document and, and without a price tag and a timeline and stuff like that, I'm not going to support the plan tonight as it is. Thank you. So if, if I may, your worship. Um, it's, it's a lot like when we brought forward the active transportation plan in that you are approving the plan in principle, but not 
all of the specific actions within it. That still has to come to council. There still needs to be a lot of discussion about, about, about each of those. But in principle, you're approving the concept that Kenful wants to become a more accessible and welcoming community. And this is a guiding document to guide the community and council towards achieving that goal. It doesn't mean that every single thing, much like the AT plan, that every single thing um, needs to be done in order to achieve that. But these are what the community has told us. And so we, it, I, I believe that it at least deserves recognition um, and then allowing the committee to further address it. So you're not approving each of these individual projects. That would be ridiculous for lack of a better term, but you are approving the plan in principle. That's what we're asking for. Thank you, uh, Director Benningfield. Did you have anything else, Councilor Gerard? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Director Bedingfield, I just um, wanted to say thank you to, to you and, and the team and all the work that was done. You know, I picked out a, a couple little things, you know, when they talk about healthy, vibrant, and integrated with all the citizens. And um, I like that Houdini, Houdini Design was certified in, you know, Rick Hansen, uh, the foundation design. I loved the nine pillars of accessibility. I thought it brought the plan together really, really well. And I like how they how they went into each of the nine pillars and then at the end sort of recapped everything together. Um, you know, when they talk about this being a universal design and, you know, and talk about the AT plan and how it was a nice dovetail into that. And I think, I think the verbiage they used at the end was let's marry them. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what they, anyway, I, I, I liked that. I, I, I felt it was a nice fit. I think overall it was done really well and I just wanted to say I appreciate the substantive work that went into it. When you think about the, the elders and the adults and the kids and Vansda and the portal and Chrysalis, there's just so much work and time that went into it. And um, I just thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Savage. I appreciate that you um, that you recognized all of that. The um, you know, one of the things I like to draw people's attention to is on page 19, the actions. And this is really what needs to be uh, focused on in terms of the committee. So developing the standards, uh, using our, our recommended benchmarks that are listed in there, um, building capacity and awareness, collaborate and support, compliance and enforcement, and monitor and evaluate. And that under each of those are suggestions, but that's really what the, kind of the focus is on. But I appreciate your also acknowledgement of um, yeah, we did go about it a bit of a different way yeah. um, on purpose. And it was a lot of, it was challenging in a lot of ways because it's kind of, it is a plan that's out of the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, the active transportation plan, the link to it was really important to the committee because we want to make sure the council knows that, uh, you know, we're not just making these plans willy nilly. They all kind of connect. We're all going towards the same vision. And if you remember the active transportation plan, one of the requirements was to view the AT through the lens of accessibility. Exactly. So it makes a lot of sense that this plan would then say, oh, here's actually already really good work. Let's make sure we continue on this. And then on top of that, here's some, here's some bonus things. So I appreciate um, that awareness. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, it, it has been a real honor to be serving on this committee. I, I think uh, <clears throat> the committee is doing some really good work. And when you look at AT, it is accessibility. It's making our town accessible to everybody, not just people who are driving cars, but it's being able to get everybody around the entire town safely to whichever area of town that they want to go. And, uh, and I think we have to get away from, you know, thinking it's all, only about bikes and cars. It, it's a lot more than bikes and cars. And I think a lot, some of the, um, you know, points that were brought up and not, not knowing, are we going to build a car park and are we going to do, you know, we are looking at a plan that, you know, we wanted to have some kind of ideas of what could be done. And you know these these are ideas right now. The committee can take those ideas and they can use one outright, or you know, trying to, to develop that, or can take an idea and modify it 
and change it a little bit so it suits the town of Kentville. You know, we're not in the city of Halifax or the city of Toronto, so maybe a you know big uh, three-story car park uh, downtown uh, isn't going to work here. Um, but it doesn't stop us from having a starting point, which is an example. Here's an example of what you could do. Oh, okay, well, I see that. Now, how can we make something fit the town of Kentville? That example may not fit. And I think that's what Director Bedingfield is trying, is trying to say, mm -hmm. is that these are ideas. They're, they're starting points. They're thinking points. They're, they're, they're ideas to get the committee started on what projects could be put in place. And, uh, and I think that's the way that we have to look at it and then let the committee present the projects and bring them to council and say, okay, this is kind of what, what we think might, might work uh, to accomplish this goal, this goal, and this goal. And uh, so that's where I see our committee going and, uh, and it is exciting work. So thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Zabian. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just want to make it clear, I'm all for accessibility. I just, I would have liked to have seen um, a, something presented with, with definitive plans. I, I had the liberty of looking at Wolfles and I mean, they've got it scoped out for a couple of years and they're, they're gonna do this, this and this. Yeah, that's just where my thought is on it, but I, I'm not anti-accessibility. I just, I, this plan is not presented the way I would have personally liked to have seen it presented. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So I just want to rem remind uh, members of council that uh, the, the words in the motion that we're looking at are receipt and ado adoption of the action plan and support of implementation of priority phasing and full, full implementation through our budgetary process. So the next time that you will see any of these elements will be next year when we sit down and we're looking at capital and you will see a project sheet on it and you will see the, the amount of funding that is being asked for. The other thing as well is that it is talking about priority phasing. So the last, um, the last two pages of the document have the, the priority phasing and, uh, and our parking garage is a very low priority. So uh, I don't think that we will see it during our tenure on, uh, on council for this, uh, this session. Um, but um, anyway, the next time you will see this will be at the budget and that's when, uh, you know, the hard questions and, uh, and whether or not we fund it, uh, you know, that's part of our, uh, our job is to determine what gets funded. Uh, so if, uh, if there is no further uh, questions, uh, I will, oh, Councillor Dreyer. Um, that, that was a mistake, but while I've got your attention, um, um, Director Bettingfield said we're, we're accepting this in principle, but that's not what the recommendation says. Am I correct? Um, no, I, I'm confused now. Director Bettingfield? Um, I actually don't have the recommendation in front of me. So it's... It's the question is that CAC recommends approval to town council of receipt and adoption of the accessibility action plan and further that council support the implementation of priority phasing recommendations, recognizing that full implementation will fall with the approved budgetary process. So nothing will happen until we get a project cut sheet back into our budget process and we approve or um, defeat it. But it's not as simple as we're just we're we're accepting the the accessibility plan or or Kenful's uh, way forward in accessibility in principle. It's a little more complicated than that. That's correct. That's okay. correct. Now you must remember that by 2030 we are mandated that the entire province of Nova Scotia will be fully accessible, and this plan puts the town of Kentville at the leading edge of this. Uh, we, could, we could and will and are currently first out of the gate on this. If I may, Your okay. Worship, Thank another you. thing to note with the plan is that this is a plan for the town of Kentville, town, so proper, town proper, mm -hmm. not just us. Uh, so part of the work of the committee is to work with, for example, KBC 
and work with the businesses in town to talk about where is the funding to create more a uh, more accessible environment. It's it's to work with um, you know local organizations. So um, working on our own house, if you will. Um, so it's it's a large it's a large piece, but we it's also understanding the, the residents and educating residents and, and creating all those things. So it's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. This is just the beginning, um, but this is just kind of the blueprint for what needs to happen. So um, you know we had talked actually about um, items like the the parking garage, knowing that it would be a bit of a shiny thing that people would draw their attention to, but. Uh, decided to keep it in there because the conversation around the parking garage was so valuable around this idea that um, from an accessibility perspective we were told that people want to want to find more places to be able to um, be downtown and be comfortable downtown where they don't feel that they're um, at, um, at risk um, for, for, for cars or things like that. Um, so that conversation is what led to that. It doesn't mean that that's the direction we're gonna go, but we need to acknowledge that that conversation happened and that's what our citizens um, uh, wanted to tell us about. Right, all right, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Is there any further discussion on this matter? Are you ready for the question? So the question is that CAC recommends approval to town council of receipt and adoption of the Town of Kentville Accessibility Action Plan, and further that Council support the implementation of priority phasing recommendations recognizing that full implementation will fall with the approved budgetary process proposed annually at the 31st of May 2021 Council meeting. Deputy Mayor, how say you? Absolutely. All righty. <laughs> Councilor Gerard? Uh, no. Okay. Councilor Huntley? Yes. Councillor Maxwell. Oh yes. Councillor York. Yes. Councillor Zabian. No. And I say yes. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. All right. Our next uh, piece of uh, business is with regards to uh, Access Awareness Week 2021, and um, we'll move right into uh, into the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, it actually takes pay place from May 30th to June the 5th with live virtual events that will be recorded and shared during the course of that week. The theme this year is where we were, where we are, and where we want to be. And I think we've mm -hmm. seen that tonight with our plan. So the, pro the proclamation of Access Awareness Week, May 30th to June 5th, 2021. Whereas the week of May 30th to June 5th, 2021 is recognized at Ask as Access Awareness Week, and Access Awareness Week claims to celebrate achievements made both by and for persons with disabilities in the area of accessibility, transportation, housing, employment, recreation, education, and communication. And this is the 34th year that this public awareness initiative has taken place in Nova Scotia. And Access Awareness Week promotes the inclusion of all Nova Scotians with disabilities as full citizens within our communities. And through public awareness, community partnerships, and education, this campaign aims to foster an environment of equal participation for persons with disabilities within the town of Kentville. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Sandra Snow, on behalf of Town Council, do hereby proclaim May 30th to June 5th, 2021, as Access Awareness Week in the Town of Kentville. And that's dated this evening. Thank you. All right. And that is uh, all of our uh, work tonight on new business. So we do have um, confidential business, which must be conducted in a closed session. And we do require a motion to go into the closed session to discuss the agenda items. And we will not be returning to Facebook Live for adjournment of this meeting. So if I could have a motion to move into the closed session to discuss the agenda item, please. Councillor Zabian, thank you. And uh, Councillor Gerard, did I see your hand for my second? All right, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that council move into a closed session. The question is on adoption of the motion to move into a closed session. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried and the time is 7.58. And if we could shut recording off and Facebook.